New King James Version. Now it says, For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Twelve. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. I want you to follow the word outside the gate or without the camp or outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. 13. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. 14. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Another simpler version, maybe Message Bible. This, verse 11, in the old system, the animals are killed and the body is disposed of outside the camp. The blood is then brought inside to the altar as a sacrifice for sin. 12. It's the same with Jesus. He was crucified outside the city gates. That is where he poured out the sacrificial blood that was brought to God's altar to cleanse his people. 13. So let's go outside where Jesus is, where the action is, not trying to be privileged inside us, but taking our share in the abuse of Jesus. 14. This inside the world is not our home. We have our eyes peeled for the city about to come. Give us a translation like um, amplified, amplified version. Just so that we understand. Amplified. Verse 11. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. 12. Therefore Jesus also suffered and died outside the gate so that he might sanctify and set apart for God as holy the people who believe through the shedding of his own blood. 13. So let us go out to him outside the camp bearing his contempt, the disgrace and shame that he had to suffer. 14. For here we have no lasting city but we are seeking the city which is to come. Lastly, give us New Living, New Living Translation. And this we can read together for emphasis, impact. Uh, verse 11. Let's read together verse 11. Under the old system. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. We pray for wisdom. We pray for understanding. Thank you for the gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, the book of Hebrews, the writer of the book of Hebrews, write to the Hebrews, just as it is called, uh, Hebrews who have converted from Judaism to Christianity. Remember, the Jews are brought up under very strict ordinance or tradition of religion. They follow meticulously things that are laid out in the law of Moses. They are able, bit by bit, if you look at the accounts of Jesus, especially his confrontation with the scribes and the Pharisees, it's about the law or the obedience of religion because there are things that are laid down in the law uh, that the Jews follow to the latter. And when the message comes, because it starts from Jerusalem and spread after the persecution of the saints, the Bible declares that the apostles were scattered to the ends of the earth. And so they preached the word of God, and the Jews who were Judaists uh, listened to the word and are able to be converted to Christianity. 
But at this time, they go under severe persecution because people are telling them that we have a better religion. Judaism is better than any other religion. And you have forsaken the better way of religion. And they are persecuted. And some of them have started to fall back. The writer of Hebrews write to them these words. And he wants to compare what is happening in Judaism, what they hold dear, with what is happening in the new covenant. He says to them, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, that God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke to our forefathers by the prophets, has in the last days chosen to speak to us by his son, Jesus Christ. That though in the last days he spoke to, he spoke to our forefathers in different ways. He spoke through an earthquake and a smoke and the commandments and the law and they brought prophets to us. In these last days, our God has chosen to speak to us by his son. And he tells us, verse 4, that you were chosen before the foundation of the earth and that God is speaking to you today by his son. There is nothing that is preeminent or supreme or better or brighter than Jesus Christ. And the book of Ephesians tells us that Jesus Christ now is the true representation of the, of, of the Father. In fact, when he's speaking to his disciples, he tells them that whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And Jesus Christ is a better covenant, is a better priest. So he starts telling them that there is no none of the angel that he spoke like he has spoken to Jesus. That the angels were better in your days because they regarded angels. You remember when Jacob was in Bethel and he was asleep, he saw us a ladder going up to heaven and the angels ascending and descending. Angelic visitation was a very good thing to have for those that were chosen or set apart. But he tells them there is one that is now better than the angels. The Jews really obeyed and respected their sanctuary and their tabernacle. But God now tells them that in these last days, we don't have a physical place. And that is what he's telling the Samaritan woman at the well in Acts chapter 4 verse 23 from 20 to 24. He tells them now we'll not go to Jerusalem to worship because now in the new covenant, a better thing than the old tabernacle has come to us. So that is why... In the, when you read the book of Hebrews, you are going to find things like better, more, meaning that the covenant is better, is better than the old covenant. And he speaks to them and tells them that the bulls were offered by the high priest and burned outside the camp. And then the blood was brought inside the camp to the Holy of Holies so that once a year, uh, the priest might offer that blood as atonement for the remission of sins for the children of Israel. He said, likewise, Jesus Christ has moved by his own blood, being the chief high priest, has come in by his own blood and gone outside the camp so that he can offer his own, own blood. And he says, now we do not look for a city like this one, the former city, but we look for a better city. For us to understand what the writer of the Hebrew is talking of the Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews is talking about, we must go back and understand the setting of the Old Testament. What is it that the writer is talking about? Let's go back to Numbers chapter 5 from verse 2. Numbers chapter 5 from verse 2 to 4 uh, is telling us, command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper, everyone who has a discharge and whoever becomes defiled by a corpse. Verse 3. You shall put out both male and female. You shall put them outside the camp. I'd say that when we read, you take note of the word outside the camp. Said you shall put them outside the camp that they may not defile their camps in the midst of which I dwell. Verse 4. 
And the children of Israel did so and put them outside the camp as the Lord spoke to Moses, so the children of Israel did. You would notice in this verse that it was the practice of the Israelites that anybody who is defiled, meaning not right, or in contravention of the law of God, was supposed to be put outside the camp, meaning banished from the congregation of his people. So the outsiders were the defiled people who are leprous, people who are sick in some way. They were not permitted to dwell inside the camp. The Bible says put them away, out of the camp. Leviticus 13 uh, verse 46. Leviticus 13 verse 46. Says, as long as the serious disease lasts, they will be ceremonially unclean. They must live in isolation in their place where? Outside the camp. So long as they are defiled, they have a serious disease, they must be kept outside the camp. I want you to see the picture of the people who are outside the camp. Because people who are inside the camp are people who are healthy. People who don't have uh, communicable diseases. People who are, do not have physical deformities. As long as they are unclean, according to the law, they must be kept outside the camp. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 14. Leviticus 24, uh, verse 14. It says, take the blasphemer outside the camp, and tell all those who heard the cast to lay their hands on his head, then let the entire community stone him to, meaning that if you have somebody who has uh, uh, contravened the law or done a sin that cannot be forgiven, that guy cannot be stoned inside the camp. He must be taken outside the camp to be stoned. So you are seeing people who are leprous, people who are sick, people who are rejected, People who have done uh, something against the law, they are seated outside the camp. And then people who have done a sin that cannot be forgiven are stoned outside the camp. I want you in your mind to picture the people that are outside the tent or the camp. Whenever they see the gates of Jerusalem open, what do they think? They think there is another one that has defiled himself, another one that is sick, another one that is rejected, or another one that is just about to be stoned. Are you seeing? So people who are outside the camp are people with problems. There are people who are dejected. There are people who are sick. And remember, you're only piling the sick people together and nobody to help them. Because a leprous man did not have limbs. And anybody who has a sickness that is communicable, you put him outside the camp. It means you're only multiplying the disease outside the camp. Is that true? The adulterers, the fornicator, the rejected, the contravener of the law is outside the camp. But if they have done a sin that is beyond forgiveness, they are stoned. And the stoners are the people who are the uh, custodian of the law. When they stone him or her, you remember the adulterous woman? They brought her to Jesus and say, according to our law, she deserves to be. So you take him outside the camp and you stone the woman. But the people who stone are the people who are writing the law. So after they stone, they go back to the camp. What do they leave? They leave a corpse, isn't it? And stoning does not mean your life has just been taken away. It's messy, isn't it? There's blood all over. You cannot be looked upon. So the people who are sick and dejected and having their own problem, they have to clean the mess. Otherwise, they live with it. So you can see outside the camp are people who are rejected and then they have corpses. The smell, the stench is a sorry state to live. We see this when um, uh, Miriam... Miriam has a disagreement. Uh, Miriam and Aaron, the brother of Moses, have a disagreement with him because he has taken an Ishmaelite or somebody who is outside the family of God. And Miriam and Aaron are not happy with it, so they confront him. Confront him. Uh, but in Numbers 12, verse 10, 
we see the cloud of God descending in Numbers 12 uh, verse 10. We see the cloud of God descending to give judgment to the infraction that has just happened. Numbers 12 verse 10. Numbers 12 and verse 10, he says, As the cloud moved from above the tabernacle, there stood Miriam, her skin as white as snow from leprosy. When Aaron saw what had happened to her, verse 11, he cried out to Moses, Oh my master, please don't punish us for this sin we have so foolishly committed. Verse 12 says, don't let her be like a stillborn baby already decayed at birth. 13. So Moses cried out to the Lord, oh God, I beg you, please heal her. Uh, verse 14. Uh, but the Lord said to Moses, if her father had done nothing more than spit in her face, wouldn't she be defiled for seven days? So keep her outside the camp for seven days, and after that she may be accepted back. For, so the people who have been rejected by their parents because if an elder or a father was to spit on a child, that child would be defiled for seven days. So they are taken out of the camp because they are rejected by their parents so that after seven days they may be reconciled back to the camp. He says she has sinned and the sin she has committed is more than being spat on. So she shall leave the camp. This was a minister. This was a leader among the congregation of the Israelites. But he has committed wrong, sin before God. So he, she, he must be, she must be taken outside the camp for seven days before she's readmitted. Re Are you understanding? So we are looking at outside the camp and the people that are outside the camp, they are they rejected. Who else is outside the camp? Who else is outside the camp? Who else is outside the camp? Let me ask, according to these rules and regulation, where would you be? Inside the camp or outside the camp? Because it's the thief, is the liars, is the adulterers, uh, whoever has, because if you have a grudge, then you are a murderer. But you are now the candidate for stoning, isn't it? Those, in fact, most of you would not be outside the camp, would be a corpse outside the camp, isn't it? Because you are stoned already. Yeah? Yes. You'll be a... Um, a bloody mess outside the camp. So all these people are taken outside the camp. In fact, for the priest was not permitted to go outside the camp. The nature of the, the routine of a priest, in Leviticus 16, verse 21, Leviticus 16, uh, Leviticus 16, look at how the, pri the priest uh, does his job. He said, he will lay both of his hands on the ghost's head and confess. Uh, before we read this, let me give you a little background. Because this is the Feast of Atonement. Every year, once a year, they would come to the temple and carry out this feast. So for the remission of the sins of the children of Israel. Now, the children of Israel would bring two gods to the priest. And the Bible declares that he would put, he would cast a lot on the two goats to determine which one was to be used for the burnt offering and the second one was used to, as a scapegoat. Now, the priest would come in verse 21 and lay both of his hands on the goat's head and confess over it all the wickedness, rebellion, and sins of the people of Israel. In this way, he would transfer the people's sins to the head of the goat. Then a man special chosen for the task will drive the goat into the wilderness, meaning outside the camp, because it's a sinful God now. The sins of Israel have been transferred to the God. 22. As the God goes into the wilderness, it will carry all the people's sins upon itself into a desolate land. 23. 
When Aaron goes back into the tabernacle, he must take off the linen garments he was wearing when he entered the most holy place and he must leave the garments there. Are you understanding? That after the burnt offering, if he has to pour away the ashes, he must undress, remove all the holy dresses that he has, leave them in the temple, and then go with the common garment outside the camp so that he be not defiled. Because if he left with his garment to the outside, outside the camp, he would also be defiled. And why doesn't he want to go with his normal garments? Because there are sinners there. There are liars there. There are abortionists there. There are adulterers there. There are murderers there. So it, he wants that every time he associates, even his clothes, he will leave, burn them. You come back and leave those clothes and burn them before you wear the new clothes of the priests. Now these people, once they are driven out of the land, uh, remember in the land of Israel, out of the 12 tribes of Israel, the Jacob's sons, every one of them was given an inheritance, a place to occupy. But the Bible says that of the Levites, God did not give them a land. He said, I am going to be your inheritance. All the children of Israel, whether it is Reuben or uh, um, God or Asher or Naphtali, all of them had been given a place. And you'll find when you're reading scripture that every region were given out. I say, this land on the east shall be Naphtali's. This land on the west shall be Asher's and God's and uh, Benjamin and the rest of them. But for Levi, the Bible says, we shall not give you a place because you shall be my inheritance. Out of all these places, Levi were given 48 cities where to dwell. Though they did not own the place, that was the inheritance from the Lord. Out of... The, out of the 48 cities that they were given, six of those were referred to as cities of refuge, meaning places where the people who are outside the camp can run to. If you committed a felony and you are not, it's not the fatal or capital punishment kind of felony, you'd run to that place for refuge. And anybody in that city would not be killed. But so long as you are outside the perimeter of that city, the six cities that were chosen, maybe we can read those cities in Joshua chapter 20 and verse 8. 8 and 9, Joshua 20 verse 8. It says, on the east side of the Jordan River, across from Jericho, the following cities were designated. Let's read again together. It says, on the east side... Across the, the following cities. Yes, so this was a kind of remand, probationary land, that you'd be taken there waiting trial. That if you committed a sin, you'd run to that place, because if you ran to that place, the person to whom you had committed a felony would not kill you. But if you were found wandering outside that city, you'd be killed. So you stay in that city. If they have said stay there for seven years, then you will stay there for seven years before you are reinstated back to the camp. These were people who were running away. These were people who had... For, so remember when you commit a felony, you are, you, it's either that felony it, uh, affects your whole family or not. So these are people who are, had left their family in the camp. These were people who were lonely in their own place. These were people who were suffering in their own way. They'd run to the city, called the cities of refuge, whether they were in Gad or Manasseh or Reuben, all those lands, they had run away from their camp. And now they were just thinking about what those guys were enjoying. Remember to be away of the, out of the camp was something very important because 
The land, the camp is where the ark of God dwelt. That is where God dwelt. And these people were referred to as the people of God or the covenanted people. So if you are out of the camp, it means you are like somebody of the world, somebody of the Gentiles, a company of the Gentiles. You could only hear stories of what God is doing in the camp and how God is moving with his people. But you could not enjoy it because you are outside the camp. And why? It's because you have done something against the law. Now we see a scenario when Moses is walking with the children of Israel. He comes to a land and uh, comes to the, to the slopes of Sinai. And Moses is taken away to God to talk to him. But it takes too long. And the children of Israel lack patience to wait for the man of God to come down and bring the information or the news or the word from God. Uh, so they call Aaron, who is the chief priest, and tell him, uh, please, Moses is delaying and we need something to worship. So prepare for us something, uh, something that we can worship. So he says, M M Aaron tells them, please give me your ornaments and your jewelry and whatever else that you have, uh, because they are using what they possess to form their idols. And sometimes the things that God blesses you with becomes your idols. You forsake the giver and adore whatever it is given to you. So you look at your cars and your houses and your job and you forget who has given uh, to you. So they, they give to Aaron this jewelry and he prepares what we call a golden calf. By the time Moses is coming down from the mountain, he finds the people who have forgotten about the God of Israel. They have forgotten about how to worship him. They are bowing down at a golden image. So he's very angry and he, he breaks the tablets. And God says, I want to annihilate or destroy these people. And then he gives them a word. We read that in Exodus chapter 33, Exodus 33, from verse 1 to 11. We see now God giving instruction to the children of Israel. What does he tell them? Uh, Exodus 33, 1. He says, the Lord said to Moses, get going, you and the people brought up from the land of Egypt. Go up to the land I saw to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told them, I'll give them this land to you Mm-hmm. And I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the, all the enemies that you think about. Verse 3 says, go up to this land that flows with milk and honey, but I will not, for you are a stubborn and rebellious people. If I did, I would surely destroy you along the way. Are you seeing the contradiction in that statement? Give us back verse 3. There is a contradiction here because he says, I will go up to this land that flows with what? But I will not but the land has milk and honey. You receive the gold. You receive all the substance. But I will not go with you. So material blessing does not mean that God is with you. Hmm? You might have everything in life, but you lack who? God. He says, but I will not be with you because I will destroy you. You are rebellious people. What happens to them in verse 4? What do they do as a response? Uh, verse 4, it says, when the people heard these ten words, they went into and stopped wearing their jewelry and fine clothing. Because without gold, this jewelry does, don't make sense. They stopped wearing. What they held dear, when God tells them, now you'll have the jewelry, you'll have the blessing, you'll have the wealth, but I will not be with you. They threw them away. Because they realized we only need God in our lives. And without him, everything else lacks meaning. Otherwise, in other words, what God was saying, you'll be outside the camp because you see the presence of God is in the tabernacle at this time. He's in the tabernacle. Verse 5. What does the word of God say? For the Lord had told Moses to tell them, you are a stubborn, rebellious people. If I were to travel with you for even a moment, I would destroy you. Remove your jewelry and fine clothes while I decide what to. Mm. He says, whatever you have, all those cars you have and the bank money, set them aside. I want you to meet, to meet me as a man. You understand? And show me your greatness. Because sometimes the money you have makes you think you're great. Mm? 
what God has blessed you with makes you th- it gets into your head makes you believe that I'm great now I'm great because I can speak anyhow I can afford everything now I'm great God says put them aside now let's talk and he spoke these words to Job and he told them now let me speak to you as a man speaketh to the other huh? you have complained for a long time now I want to see your wisdom come let us reason And let me see where your wisdom is. He told them, keep those aside. And then I'm going to come back tomorrow, then we can talk. When God tells you, put your everything away and uh, then I'm going to, while I decide what to do, what do you think? When you are seated somewhere and God has said, I'm going to decide what to do with you. Hmm? What are you thinking? Do you remember my jewelry or oh, my gold? Where did I put it? My project, that land I've not visited. Do you? No, you don't. Because now, his question, his statement has provoked you to think about the most important thing. Verse 6. He says, so from the time they left Mount Sinai, the Israelites wore no more. Or? Are you seeing? Now it didn't make sense. Before, when they come from uh, Egypt to Sinai, those are 40 days, they have met the presence of God because that is Pentecost. Once they interact with God's presence, everything else fades in significance. They don't value anything anymore. They only value his presence. Most of us have, do not value God's presence because we have not interacted with him. Because once you interact with him, everything else is like dung. The Bible says, Paul says, whatever I have achieved this far, I consider it dung. Because of the revelation of God. They, they wore no more jewelry or fine clothes. Verse 7. It was Moses' practice to take the tent of meeting and set it up some distance from the camp. Everyone who wanted to make a request of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside. Remember, they are leaving. The tabernacle was inside the camp because they built their tents around the tabernacle. But now an infraction has happened. God's presence has shifted from the tabernacle. Now Moses has to pitch a tent of meeting outside the camp. To meet God's presence. To leave the common four walls of the church. And to leave the place of comfort and tradition. And go outside to the unimaginable. So that they can have God's presence. Now we don't have time to continue reading this story of uh, Moses and the children of Israel. But you realize if we went back to the book of Hebrews. The Bible says now that the... The bulls and the goats are sacrificed and burned outside the camp. The same way Jesus Christ has moved outside the camp with his own blood. Meaning now the presence of the Lord is not inside the camp with what we call the insiders. The people who thought they qualify. God has broken those boundaries and now is interested with the outsiders. The people that were dejected. The people that were sent away. The people that could not fit into the society. The people who thought that they were not worthy. Jesus has left the camp. He has gone outside those people who don't think that they are worthy. So that he can bring them in. He says he left the camp so that he can uh, bring them in. This should excite you, child of God, because if you would not have qualified according to the regulations of the law, meaning the grace of God has made you qualified. Whatever it is that kept you away from the grace of God, Jesus, by his own blood, he says, without the the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins or forgiveness of sins. And by his own blood, he has made you have access to the place where otherwise you would not gain access. God has moved out of the camp. So he says, let us together with him move outside the camp and take on his reproach or his shame. Because God is no longer in the tabernacle. He's outside the camp. He's moved outside the camp. 
where you and I dwell. He's no longer now with the proselytes, the Jews, the Sanhedrin sitting to judge the others. No, he has left. So the people that were rejected and forgotten, and the people that were living in smelly environment and terrible environment, that is where Jesus has gone. Jesus has taken the discouraged, the dejected, the, the people who are otherwise rebellious, and the people who could not qualify or be shortlisted for the masses of God. Those are the people that God has taken. The Bible declares, Galatians 3 uh, verse 13, it says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Why? Because he has become a curse for us. For it is written, curse is anyone that hangs on the tree that the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles and that we might receive the gift of the Spirit, verse 14, by faith. So we have been removed from the curse of the law. You know, today, if you hear Christian pray, you will understand that their minds have not yet been set free. Because they have this, always they have this chain, they have this captivity, because, and you will know that by the way they pray. Mm? They have this imaginary chain. They have this imaginary captivity. Because all their prayers are violent prayers. They are fighting something. They are not praying towards. They are praying from. But God has said, now pray towards. Because you can't spend one hour binding things that are not there. The Bible says Christ has redeemed you from the curse of the law. But you still have an outsider's mentality. That things are chasing you. You know, when you wake up in the, mo in the morning and you have a, a bad dream, you think it is happening, even after you've woken up. So Christians, wake up! God has given us freedom. We are walking now in liberty. Because if you don't have this wisdom, you move from place to place, sanctuary to sanctuary, moving, thinking that now God is in Mombasa. God is in Nakuru. God is in Busia. Not knowing that God has left the camp. He's not now in the tabernacle commenced by the hands of men. He's outside the camp, wherever you are. Now we don't go to God. God has come to us. Hmm? God is in your house. God is in your working place. God is in your vehicle. God is everywhere. Now we don't need a special person who is up there to speak to you on behalf of. There is no mediator apart from Jesus Christ. You don't need a go-between. That curtain has been broken. That foundation has been destroyed. Now we have left the, the, the camp. There is no outsider and insider. All of us are in the family of God. He says he made he who was not seen to be seen for us, that we may be the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21, that he made he who knew no sin to be seen, so that we might be the righteousness of God. But how are the Russians speaking? The Russians are already speaking like they are still the problematic people outside the camp. They are still thinking, I am bound. I'm destroyed. So their prayers is about pulling things by fire, by thunder. And we have adapted so much of this Nigerian nonsense, this witchcraft from Nigeria. Those are the, the things that are commanding our prayers. I mean, if you enter the place of intimacy with God, you have God consciousness throughout. But most of us have devil's consciousness all the time. We think he's against us every, and he's everywhere. Magnify his presence more than the presence of God. Come on, believers, we have left the camp. We are outside. <laughs> the Bible says, now let us go outside the camp where Christ is and take our reproach with him. The written code that was against us, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, has been blotted, broken, meaning that when they stand up to read our accusation, the page is blank. They don't have a charge sheet on our behalf. When the enemy stands on that place and you are seated at the accuser's corner, he, he says, but I thought this guy was accused for something. But why is this page blank? It's because the written code that was against us has been broken, nailing it on the cross. The Bible says, verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Are you seeing that? Read that again for yourself. Because some of us don't read the Bible. We are waiting for a man of God. 
to confuse us. Read that. He says, look, in, his, in this way, in this way, how? By bloating the transgression that was against us, he disarmed them, spiritual powers and authorities. He shamed them what? Why are you behaving as if this didn't happen? This has happened. Now we are in the family of God. We are not the outsiders. We don't need a special ticket to be part of the club. We don't need a special entry or admission to be part of the selected few. We are already members. And let me give you good news. That which you didn't know. There is no special entry to God's presence because of a title. The fact that he's called reverend does not mean he has access. You also have access. You are a child of God. Some of us think that one because he wears a collar he's more closer. I came to you man of God because you are closer. That is religious mindset. All of us are the same before God. We have equal entry. The camp has been broken. The tabernacle is no longer there. So don't be running from mission to mission because they have a powerful convention. No. Sit in your house. Call upon God's presence. He will come. Because he's no respecter of Acts chapter 10 verse 34. He respects no one. Wow. My time is over. Let me just read one verse and then we close. Acts chapter Hebrews chapter 13 verse 14 that which we read that's what I want to close on Hebrews 13 13 for this world is not our read, read that again do you believe it or you are just saying it's not, we are not permanent big people look we are looking forward to what why is he saying this is because the outcast, you know, being in Jerusalem and inside the camp was a very privileged thing. You understand? The people of the covenant, the chosen people, close to God. But when you are sent outside the camp, you see, you just hear what is happening. You are no longer part of the privilege. And now you have been removed out of the city. Jerusalem was an important city. Jerusalem, the city of peace. Now you are outside the peace. Now, when he's writing to them, he tells them, now we have a better city. We left Jerusalem and we thought we are outcasts. But look, there is something better God is preparing for us. Give us Galatians 4 verse 22. Galatians 4, Galatians 4 verse 22. It says, scripture says, let's read together. Ah, ah, ah. There is no hurry. We are not competing. We are just reading for understanding. Verse 22, let's read. had two sons, one from his slave, who was the slave wife? Yeah? Hey, say louder so that people who have not read it before can understand. Who was the slave wife? Hagar. And one from his? Who was the freeborn wife? Right, let's continue. 23, the son of the slave wife, who was the son? Ishmael. Was born in a human and to bring about are you seeing that? People were trying to fulfill God's purpose. But the son was born as God's own. God was fulfilling his promise through Isaac. But Ishmael was an attempt of men to fulfill his purpose. 25? 23? Okay, 24. He says? He says, I'm telling you because it's just an example. It was a shadow of what I want to show you. You understand? That happened physically, not because it had any importance, but it happened so that I teach you something. What is he teaching us? He says, it's an illustration of what? Of God's two. Oh, the first woman represent where people received Wow. But Sene was powerful. God's presence came. But that place was of the law. It enslaved them. Verse 25. And now Jerusalem is just like Mount because she and her children live in He says, don't look back at the city of Jerusalem. 
It's an enslavement of the law. Verse 26, what does it say? But the other woman represents, she is there, and she is. Wow. Wow. She's our mother. And we have to do what our mother is doing. We don't look at the things on the earth. We look at the things above. If you read Hebrews 11 about faith, it tells you these people were sown asunder, were persecuted, and Abraham looked for a city whose founder and builder is God. It's not looking at the... Abraham was damn rich. Hmm? Some of you speak about your wealth because you are not rich. Rich people don't speak about their wealth. How do you know somebody is drunk when they are not talking, isn't it? Because the people who have just sniffed something, they, they have a lot of words in their mouth. Hmm? I am drunk. That guy is not drunk because when you get drunk, you don't talk. You don't have energy. So Abraham was so rich, but those things were nothing to him. He was saying he was looking for a sitter whose builder and founder is... Wow. Get on your two feet, let's pray. Open your mouth now and tell God, I am not an outsider, I am not an outcast, I'm not rejected, dejected, no. I'm in the family of God. I matter to God. I am valuable. I am important. Speak it until the spirit confirms to you. The spirit of God shall confirm to your spirit that you are important. Anybody that has made you dejected, anybody that has made you unloved, whatever you have gone through that has caused you to think that you are not lovable, you are not valuable, you do not matter, that is the lie of the enemy. Because Christ has come out of the tent, out of the camp, to give us redemption and freedom in the name of Jesus. Come on, pray for a minute now. Pray for a minute now in the name of Jesus. Father God, we thank you, we bless you, we honor you, we magnify your name in the name of Jesus. Thank you because you have called us your own. Whatever it is that has caused us to be dejected, rejected, oh Lord, out of the place that God has called us, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you shall cause us to know that we are loved, we are important, and that we matter to God in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I know we don't have time to pray for all of you, each one of us. But get the revelation from God's word. You are important. You matter to God. All the barriers you thought are keeping you from being the special one, the scripture tells us have been broken. Receive that revelation in the name of Jesus. Walk in that revelation. You don't need a mighty man of God to lay his hands on you. Get the word of God. Get revelation from God's word. Be set free in the name of Jesus. Are you here and you are not saved? You came to this service and you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Wherever you are, you are special. You belong to the family of God. Let nobody lie to you that you do not qualify or you cannot be saved. This is the time to get saved. Lift up those hands. Lift up that hand. Lift up that hand. Right now, I want to pray with you. So that today you receive Jesus. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Lift them up. High, high, high. Lift up. Kabisa, kabisa. So that we're able to see you. Wherever you are. And pray with you. Don't leave this service. Before you are born again. There's a reason why God brought you to this service. Come on. Are you lifting up your hand? Wherever you are. So that we pray with you. You receive Jesus Christ today as your Lord and Savior. He has set you free. He has forgiven you. He has set you free. Don't leave this place in your sin. One more time, one more minute. Are you there? Lift up your hand high so that we see wherever you are standing. So that we can pray together with you. Don't leave this compound today, this church today before you say yes to Jesus. The ministry team is here. We don't have a lot of time to pray for all of you, but you can see any of them. 
And then we are going to pray together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, celebrate Jesus.